Good morning, everyone. Hope everyone's doing well. I guess it's still winter. Got a little snow out there. It is January, right? So uh, <laughs> we have a few months left. So it's good. It's good. Covers everything. Looks beautiful. Yeah, it's great. Well, uh, this is uh, we're continuing on in our doctrine class, and I trust that you'll be encouraged in our time together. Um, I'm really excited about this morning because we're going to we're going to uh, God created humans to be in awe. Right? He got created humans to, to wonder. I mean, uh, Hollywood tries to make all these epics, but nothing comes close to God and what he does. And, and we're going to gaze this, this morning, we're going to gaze into one of probably the most awesome, uh, wonder, amazing things, and that is uh, the reality that Christ became a man. We're going to get the incarnation. What does it mean that Christ became a man? Can someone actually close those doors, maybe someone back there? Eric, you, want, you guys want to close those doors? Um, yeah, uh, that'd be great. Um, what does it mean that Christ became a man? I mean, the incarnation. We're going to look at some big words. Uh, hypostatic union. What is that? We're going to talk about the kenosis. What does that mean? Uh, but it, it all relates to the fact that the God of the universe became a man. Remember last week we talked about Christ actually took on human form at times. We saw in uh, Genesis 22, uh, I'm sorry, Genesis 18, uh, where he appeared as a man. We saw in Joshua 5, he appeared as a man, but that's not incarnation. Now we're going to look at this morning as the incarnation. How did Christ, what does it mean that Christ became a man? It's just amazing, uh, phenomenal, uh, this reality. I trust that you will be just overwhelmed with the fact that Christ became a man. We'll talk about why did he have to become a man? Why was that necessary um, for your salvation, for the glory um, of God? But look at our learning exercise before we do that. And, uh, uh, and then we'll dive in. Let me open our time in a word of prayer. Oh God, you are, uh, you are awesome. You are amazing. You are awe-inspiring. And uh, the things that you do, no, obviously no human could invent. Uh, human religions are very explainable because they're from human minds. And yet, when we see true Christianity, we are in awe because no human could invent this uh, because it's truly of you. And so I pray that each of us, even though we'll probably be talking, we'll be talking about things that most here will be familiar with, that you grant each person a new understanding uh, so they understand, uh, but so they see you just in, in greater clarity and they're overwhelmed by who you are and what you've done. We thank you for that in your name. Amen. Okay, a couple questions, okay? Identify at least two scriptures. Identify why the doctrine of Christ is so important. Who can give me some scripture references? We talked about this last time. Why is the doctrine of Christ so important? Or is it just something we're making up? What are some scripture references that talk about why? Okay, good. First Corinthians 15, uh, 3 and 4. Absolutely. Let me just read that. I don't have that in my overhead, but I'll just read it. So it'll be First Corinthians 15. Two people, I had that one in stereo. Someone over here said that too. Um, uh, for I delivered to you of what? First importance, what I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried and he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. Of first importance, Christ, his incarnation, his death, his resurrection. Absolutely. Um, it was for, of first um, importance. Okay? Good. What else? Another scripture passage. Okay, Colossians 1.15, that whole section in Colossians, just saw the significance um, of that, okay? Another scripture passage. Someone have another scripture passage out here? Okay, okay, good. To be our mediator, good, good. Let me just give you a couple, just... Uh, John 5, we talk about you search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life. Uh, and these that bear witness to me, for if you believe Moses, you believe me, for he wrote of me. Just is talking about, this is, the Old Testament talked about that very clearly. And then Ephesians 1.10, uh, uh, with a view to administration, suitable to the fullness of the time, that is what? Summing up of all things in Christ. All things are, are summed up um, in Christ. I mean, there's a number of other ones that we had, but those I think would be, uh, John 5.39, um, uh, you search the scriptures because you think in them you have eternal life. You believe Moses, you believe me, for he wrote of me. Whole testament was about, about, um, about that. Okay? Number two. Please explain from class discussion why the angel orders Jesus Christ, the second person in the Trinity. Again, I know there's a little bit of controversy on that, 
but uh, I, I gave you a number of um, passages, but, or in facts. What are some things that would help us to understand that the angel of the Lord is Christ? What are some, um, yeah, what are some reasons that you had down for that? Okay, it was worship. Okay, angels are received worship. What scripture passage would refer to that? Judges 13, Genesis 20, Judges 13, where uh, 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 Samson's parents, Manoah, worships this angel. Uh, Genesis 22, um, Abraham offers his sacrifice um, uh, to the angel of the Lord. Yeah, Ben. Right. Right. So that's a good passage, Jacques Run, is of this, the distinction. They're not identical. Um, the Trinity, you know, there's a, a unity and distinction. That passage, Zechariah 1, is you have the angel of the Lord talking to God. And so there's a distinction between them. Okay. Excellent. Good observation. Well, well the first thing is the angel of Jehovah is God. What are some other passages you can think of that would help us to understand the angel of Jehovah is God? Passages you think about, um, maybe situations. The three main I think of are Genesis 22, Exodus 2, and Judges 13. Genesis 22 is when uh, 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 Abraham is called to sacrifice Isaac. Angel of the Lord appears, and the angel of the Lord says, Now I know that you fear God, since you have not withheld your son, your only son from me. And the angel of the Lord is talking and says, You didn't withhold your son from me. Um, and, you don't, you, and because of that, I know you fear God, which is amazing. Exodus 2, which is, what's Exodus 2? Burning bush, okay? This is where uh, Moses is there. He's fleeing from Pharaoh. He comes across the burning bush, and it says that um, God uh, speaks to him from the midst of the bush, and it says the angel of the Lord speaks to him from the midst of the bush. So it's the same, same. Angel of the Lord is equal to God. Also, the, that being, the angel of the Lord, what does he ask Moses to do when he walks up there? Take up your shoes. Why? You're on holy ground. No angel would ever say that. You're on holy ground because you're in my presence. No, it was in the presence of God. That's the only thing that was very even similar to that. In Judges 13, as we already mentioned with David, uh, the, uh, uh, when the angel of the Lord appears to uh, prophesy to Samson's parents, um, uh, Manoah, and, 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 John, and tells him, you need to sacrifice, make a burnt offering to me. And then he calls his name. He says, what's your name? He says, my name is Wonderful. On the other place, that's, uh, that, that name is, it's a messianic title, as a nine. Six, or his name shall be called Wonderful. Um, so there's a number of number of the passages um, related to that, but those are probably some of the um, the main ones uh, in that. Uh, we already talked about the angel uh, Jehovah's sing from Jehovah on um, that Zechariah passage, is what Ben talked about, and then this is a key passage. Only the second person of the Trinity takes bodily form. Um, Could you say, well, that's God. Um, and we talked about it quite a bit last time. Is that the any time there's a human sees God in any way, it cannot be any other than the, the second person um, of the Trinity because this passage, John 1, 18, says, no man has seen God at any time. The only begotten God who is in the bosom of the Father, he has displayed or explained him. That's it. Um, yeah, Ben. What about the dove Yeah, once again, I, 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 last week I talked about, what about the dove, um, which you see at, uh, at the baptism? Um, yeah, but actually it doesn't say he was a dove. It says, does something descended in the form of a dove? You know what I mean? It's not like, oh, there's a dove. I know some certain churches like the dove. Well, that's, um, I also said, remember last time in Acts 2, he appeared as um, told, um, tongues of fire on top of the people's heads. Well, that's just a, some kind of a symbol or a representation, but it's not, the Holy Spirit isn't a dove. Holy Spirit's not a dove. Holy Spirit's not a fire, a symbol of fire. It's just some representation of him. But by that I'm he doesn't, know, only Christ takes on bodily form, like a, a body that you can see. Those are, God takes on other, you know, like on the, you know, on top of the mountain and other things you see, uh, fire and smoke and all that. But actually for someone to actually see, that's God. It's, it's, as far as we know, only Christ. Based on this passage, no one has seen God any time except through who? Christ. Christ is the only one. Even though these are the representations um, that you would, you would see. Um, yeah, good question. Really good question. Okay. Uh, what else? Oh, and the angel of Jehovah, I mentioned this, the angel of Jehovah does not appear again after the incarnation. 
There's, after, you know, after the incarnation, there's no other angel of the Lord. You don't, you don't see him, which is amazing. Particularly when you look at the book of Revelation, you would assume there's angels everywhere in the book of Revelation, and yet the angel of the Lord isn't in the book of Revelation, but the angel of the Lord is in the book of Revelation. Right? The first chapter. Who is it? It's Christ. He's not, he's not as the messenger of God. He's Christ. He's coming back. Revelation 19 in his power and his glory. He's just not in the, the form or called the angel of the Lord. So that's, a, you know, why isn't he there? When you see Mike, you see all these angels all over the place, and yet he's not there. Okay? How else does Christ appear in the Old Testament? Not a profession. How else does Christ appear in the Old Testament? Remember those situations I talked about? Pardon me? Yes, as a man. Okay? Yeah, Genesis 18, it says there's, there's three... Yeah, People, I guess you'd say, beings came and appeared before Abraham, and and they were three men. It says three men in the text. Three men, and it's you know two angels that appeared as men, um, and then Christ Himself appeared as a man. Okay, it doesn't call him the angel of the Lord in that context. Okay, good. So as a man, what else? Do you remember the other passage, Josh chapter five, when uh, Josh is about to go into the promised land? It says there's this mighty warrior that's there, and who is this? Well, this is the captain of the Lord's army, and the way the way that's being talked, it's obvious. This is God himself. This is Christ, um, second person of the, of the Trinity. He appears as a, as a man. Genesis 18, uh, Genesis 32, and uh, Joshua 5. Okay? Good. Okay, any questions on that? We're going to dive in, continue on. You can write down your score. We'll post it next week. Or we can show, do it later in the service. Okay, yeah, Becky. Right. Right. The question is, um, Moses, you know, uh, supposed to speak to the rock. He strikes the rock, and Scripture said that rock is Christ, that metaphor. We're going to talk about one of the things later is the names of Christ or the representation. Christ is also called the door. I mean, there's all kinds of things that Christ is called. Christ is called the good shepherd. Um, So there's lots of, there's over 200 names or... um, Titles, I guess you'd say, of Christ, and rock is one of them. Um, th- that, that rock in the um, it's a symbol of Christ, pointing head to Christ. Um, I guess you could call it a type pointing head to Christ. Um, Christ isn't a rock; it's a representation of, of Him. Um, so, also, Christ isn't a door; it's just a representation of Him. There, there, it's a metaphor, so you understand. You know, obviously, <laughs> the term rock refers to strength. We think of rock. What do you think of when you think of rock? You think of like a rock you can pick up and throw. There's quite a few Hebrew words used for rock. That particular one is like Martha and I uh, in Spain. We visit the rock of Gibraltar. That's the kind of rock it's talking about. I mean, a massive cliff rock that you can cling to for strength that's immovable. That's why it's using that metaphor in reference to to Christ. Christ doesn't always appear. As a, 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 but it's just a representation of him. Okay. Well, I think we're on page 43 in your notes. Uh, we're talking about um, uh, um, ministries of Christ in the Old Testament. We just hadn't quite finished those. Um, I think it's is it 43 in your notes. Is that right? I think so. Okay. So uh, pre, we're talking about pre-incarnate uh, ministries of Christ. We talked about. Uh, remember, we talked about why this is important. Is that Christ didn't all of a sudden just show up in uh, uh, 4, B, 4 BC and say, "Okay, incarnation, here I am." No, He's been uh, involved in, in His people all the way from you know, the first point in history uh, when Adam and Eve sinned. He's walking in the garden with them. So Christ and Christ has appeared. So I'm trying to help you see that Christ was in the Old Testament actively involved in the Old Testament because that's critical so that we'd say Christ didn't just start at the incarnation. Very, very important. That's why I'm giving you all these backgrounds so you can see where he is uh, in there. Uh, and then, um, so judgment, uh, Christ was involved in judgment. First Chronicles 21. Uh, this is a situation where uh, David's number of the people. God sent an angel to Jerusalem to destroy it. As, and remember, keep going back to the Hebrew word for angel. It's, 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 it's like a messenger. It's not, we, we think of a, a being that, like an angel. And it, often they were angels because what do angels do? They're messengers for God. But Christ was being a messenger here, a messenger of judgment. As he was about to destroy it, the Lord saw and was sorry of the calamity and said to the destroying angel, it's enough, now relax your hand. And the angel of the Lord was standing by the threshing floor of Ornan the Jebusite. If you've ever pictured that scene, I mean, where David, you know, it's just a, it's an incredible scene where, you know, all these 
thousands of people been killed because of David's sin. And now we know ultimately David's going, he's going to purchase that. It's a situation where he ordered so I want to give it to you. He said, no, I'm not going to offer the Lord anything that costs me nothing. He purchases that um, site, and then he, uh, he offers a sacrifice there. Um, and so who, who's going to receive worship except God? And so it's, uh, once again, but the key is judgment. The angel of the Lord was judging, was judging very actively in that. Okay? Uh, let's look at the Testament of the New Testament, pre-incarnate uh, existence of Christ. The Son existed before time began. Uh, uh, John 1, uh, 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. What's it saying? It's saying that Christ didn't all of a sudden come into being at the incarnation. He was in the beginning, uh, far before um, the um, events of the Gospels, uh, before Bethlehem. He was far before that. He was from the very beginning uh, in eternity past. And then another passage, which I think is helpful, is John 1.30. Um, this is uh, John the Baptist talking. And John the Baptist says, This is he on, whom, on behalf of whom I said, After me comes a rank, uh, after me comes a man who has a higher rank than I, for he existed before me. Now this, this verse is an enigma. It's like, huh? Um, what's the enigma in this verse? Yeah, John the Baptist was conceived and born before Christ, at least six months before, as far as we know. Uh, and so he exists. He was before. He was before as a human. John the Baptist was a human before Christ was a human, and yet he says here, what John the Baptist says, he existed before me, and he existed from eternity past, and so he clearly um, understood that. Um, the sun existed before time uh, beca- beca- began. Another verse, uh, John eight fifty eight. Boy, the religious leaders didn't like this one. Jesus said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was born, he doesn't say I was. He says, I am, which is, a, it, it's, if you know your Old Testament, the I am statement is just a, it's a, it's a powerful statement. The, the name Yahweh comes from the Hebrew verb for I am, or the self-existent one. And so he's saying, I was before Abraham, because they're trying to compare, you know, are you greater than our father Abraham. I'm not just greater. I was before him. I existed before him. I created him. And the Jews did not like this, of course, because this is a claim to be what? God. It's a claim to be God, which they're going to want to stone him um, for. Um, And then uh, the son became, you can underline the word became, he became flesh. Um, You didn't become flesh. You were conceived and born. You You weren't something else. You weren't like before that, and then you became flesh. But Christ did. He was existent before, and then from that state, he became uh, flesh. Uh, John 1.14, uh, the word became flesh. John 1, 1, he existed, and then there came a point in time in human history that, uh, where Christ became flesh, dwelt among us. We beheld this glory. Glory is the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. None of you became flesh. You came into existence. And at that same time, you were flesh, right? Christ was different, totally different in that. He became. And then the key passage uh, for that would be Philippians 2. Whoopsie, sorry about that. Who, although he existed in the form of God, so he already existing, he's already existing as God, already existing as God, did not regard a quality with God a thing to be grasped, but then there came a point in history when what did he do? He emptied himself. We're going to look at that word, kanao, uh, the kenosis. He emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant and being made in the likeness of men. I'm, I'm just going to all these scripture passages to keep driving home because there's a lot of false um, religions out there that say, no, Christ started his existence at some point. He was created. He came into existence. But scripture is very clear. No, he existed from eternity past. And his incarnation is a point when he became human flesh. He became a man. He took on uh, human uh, flesh very, very clearly. And then here's another one. Remember, we're, we're driving at the point of Christ's preexistence. I'm taking the New Testament. And that this seems obvious, but the Son was sent into the world. So to be sent into the world means what? He had to have existed before, right? He, he had already existed at four from eternity past, and then there came a point in time where he was sent into um, the world. Uh, and there's many, many scripture passages related to this. I have several of them in your notes. Uh, but John 3:17, For God did not send the Son into the world to judge the world, but that the world should be saved uh, through him. So 
Christ was existing, eternity past, and then in the, the divine economy of the triune God, um, He was sent. He was sent. God the Father particularly said, sent His Son uh, into the world. Very, very um, key. Um, and then uh, another passage related to that, John seven twenty nine. I know Him because I am from Him, and He what? Sent me. He sent me. This was before the incarnation. He was sent, and then a part of the sending was the incarnation. It's, it's how he was sent. So he existed clearly uh, before that. Okay, any questions on that? Christ. We're going to look at the Old Testament prophecies of Christ. Just, we're not going to look at all of them. We'd be here for a year or more. Yeah, Daniel. Great question, Daniel. Um, the question is, is um, when the passage in Philippians 2, and it says that Christ became flesh. But what about the Old Testament? But the Old Testament, where like in Joshua chapter 5, or in Genesis chapter 18, where he, he appeared as a, as a man. Okay, what about that? Um, great question, and we would know there's a difference, okay? We would say in the Old Testament, and I was very careful in the wording I have in your notes, he appeared as a man. Just like those angels in Genesis 18, those those angels, it says they appeared as men, but those angels weren't men. They just took on human form. So also Christ in Genesis 18, Joshua chapter 5, there were times prior to the incarnation where he, he took on a, a human appearance. Okay? But the incarnation had not occurred. Why? Because the incarnation is directly connected to being sent by God through the virgin birth. I mean, it's where he became, that's the word, he became a man. We wouldn't say he was a man there. He appeared as a man. He took, but the taking on human flesh and actually becoming like us in a way, that didn't happen to the incarnation. It's a, it's a, it's a, it seems like a small distinction, a very critical distinction. He became a man at the incarnation. He appeared as a man in uh, the Old Testament, but he wasn't yet a man. Incarnation had not, had not yet occurred. Virgin birth had not yet occurred. He had not, why? Because we see, and he, even in those situations, he's not a regular old man. I mean, he's, I mean, he, he doesn't have the limitations that he's going to have that we're going to see in the Gospels. We're going to talk about how he, he was a man, but it was very veiled. Now, we'll see glimpses of it, you know, transfiguration, miracles, but he did not become a man. He didn't, he didn't veil the full expression of his deity until uh, the incarnation. So, do you understand the distinction on that? It's critical. It's a little, it seems a little, but it's, it's a very insightful question. Excellent. Excellent. Okay. Any other questions on that? Yeah, Kelly. Yes. Yeah, the question is, is uh, when uh, the angel uh, appears to Mary and says, you'll conceive in your womb um, through the Holy Spirit, and we'll, we'll bear a child, and his name shall be called Jesus. Is that, any, is that different than what we would, we would say? It, it was conception. You know, I, we can't get into the nuance, but it's conception. I would go all the way back to Genesis 3, and there's a nuance. He, um, Christ is called the seed of the what? Woman, which that's never, and that's unique to Christ. It's typically called the seed of the man, right? So there's some nuances that are very different. And why was why was that necessary? Why could there? Why I'd have to have the virgin birth? Right. Right. He had to have a real. He had to have a real flesh, and that's. It's through God um, in the miracle of conception. God, you know, God is the one that orchestrated that. But there's also there's something that can happen. What is that? Why can't he have a human father? Yeah, Ben. There we go. So Romans 5 talks about that is because Christ was without sin. Um, and David talks about Psalm 139, you know, that he was conceived in iniquity. That doesn't mean that his parents were sinful in their conception of him. No, but the, the, um, the sin is passed down. Romans 5 says, and we sinned in Adam, right? That you were, why do you sin? 
because you're a sinner. You were a sinner before you ever committed the first act of sin. You sin because you're a sinner. And so that's, that's a great question. You had to have the virgin birth. You had to have a unique, it had to be a, a same conception, just as in every human, but it had to be a unique conception so that the sin nature was not passed on. Christ did not have a sin nature like us. So there's, it's the same, a, a human flesh, human, human was... Um, through conception, God, I guess I'll use the word, created that. Um, but it was unique because the, the sin nature was not passed down. So it's similar. It's not like a special word that, oh, he was conceived. That, it's totally something different. No, he was conceived. Miraculously, uh, miraculously uh, through um, the Holy Spirit. Um, God did a miracle uh, in that. Good. Great question. Really good question. Okay. Anything else? Yeah, Ben. Yeah, how did it happen? Like Kelly's question is, how did that happen? Well, we don't know. It's a miracle, clearly, but God did that. God did that. Absolutely. Absolutely. Very concrete ways he did that. Okay? Let's look at Old Testament prophecies of Christ. I have some characteristics I listed down there. We're not, we're not, I can't go through all the prophecies, but just I want to give you some background on the prophecies themselves. Um, uh, many of the prophecies use um, figurative language. Uh, Becky, you referred to the rock. I mean, there's, there's figurative language. Isaiah 53. He was oppressed, he was afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. Here's the, here's the, the metaphor, the figure of language. Like a lamb that is led to slaughter, and like a sheep that is silent for its shears, so he did not open his mouth. Now, Christ was not physically a sheep, right? He wasn't. He didn't walk through, you know, no. He was a man, but he was like a lamb. And so a lot of the prophecies, you'll read a lot of the prophecies, and a lot of figurative language in it. And it's bringing out some aspect of the, this obviously, some aspect of the ministry of Christ. Isaiah 53 is obviously bringing out the sacrificial aspect of Christ's ministry. He would be, like John uh, will say, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Um, he, he, he was a fulfillment of, of Isaiah 53. So there's, you'll notice in the prophecies, there's a lot, there's a lot of figurative language um, in those. Um, there's a time perspective. Um, and this is, this is a challenge. Um, there's a time um, perspective. Um, what I mean by that is often the future is regarded as the past. And this is the way that often Hebrew and even Greek will use something that's future is spoken of in the present because it's so certain. Uh, and Hosea uh, it said, when Israel was a youth, I loved him. And out of Egypt, I called my son. And that's Matthew 2. That re- refers to that where Christ, you know, part of it is he's, he's Come out, comes out of Egypt because they fled to Egypt because of Herod. Well, it's past tense. Well, no, that's not prophecy. No, it is prophecy, even though it's in the past tense uh, in your Bibles. It's because it's so certain it's going to happen. They just write it in the past tense uh, for emphasis. Another thing, a prophetic um, perspective. Um, keep in mind multiple events. Um, uh, you know, there's a... Um, where something will happen, but it won't totally fulfill it. Like you see Joel 2, or Joel talks about the day of the Lord is coming, and he gives all these prophecies about the day of the Lord. Peter, in Acts 2, will quote um, and talk about Joel. He said, now it's fulfilled. But Peter understands it wasn't fully fulfilled. There's a lot of stuff that Joel talks about that hadn't yet fulfilled, because we won't see some of those things fulfilled until the book of Revelation. Uh, some of the things that are talked about in Joel 2, and even that Peter refers to in, in Acts 2. Um, they don't realize he didn't realize that there's at least 2,000 years between the first coming and the second coming. It could be a lot longer. It could be twice that. I don't know. Um, but there's, there's, a, there's a, a time frame uh, between that. There's a prophetic uh, perspective. Here's the way I, I like to look at it. What is this picture for? Is it just kind of to see this? Uh, no. There's a reason for this picture, okay? You look at a, you look at a range of mountains and you say, okay, yeah, that's, let's say that's uh, 20 miles away. Great. Um, what do you mean by that? Okay? Because actually, there's several ranges of mountains you hear. You have your right in the foreground, you got a little one, you got another big one, and you know there's a little distance between that one and the next one, but then that one way back there, how far away is that? I don't know, that could be 50 miles away, right? And so we're looking at it as snapshot, picture, prophet, he tells us the picture, here's what it is, but it's like you look at a range of mountains, 
There could be a lot of time, distance for us, a lot of distance between those different events. Like Peter, he says, now is it fulfilled? Well, yeah, he's, he's standing on the middle mountain, but he doesn't realize that there's a whole, a whole, you know, another range of mountains that all the fulfillment of Joel 2 that's going to happen, uh, he doesn't realize it. Yeah, um, so there's a, there's a distance there. So when you read a prophecy, well, that all has to happen right then. No, some of it did, but still, there's a, there's a, long, there's a lot of distance between that. Yeah, Birch. Yeah, as humans, our perspective of time is different. God's view of time is different. That's true. Um, but I would say that Christ operated within history. Um, in other words, uh, yeah, Christ operated within history. But, I, but then you look at what he said, you know, before Abraham was, I am, obviously. It's saying there's a different phrase in it. Or even when they would give these prophecies, they are in God's economy. Yeah, it's as, in a sense as good as happened. And so it's going to happen. Uh, it will happen. Uh, the cross, you know, but there's an order order of time. You know, God is not the author of confusion. There's a, you know, not a logical contradiction. Um, so there is a, in history, Christ operated in history, and so this is, what I'm talking about here is in history in that time frame. Okay? We don't believe in the, the circle of life. Okay? It's very, 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 very unbiblical. You know, they like to slide those very unbiblical things through the, whatever, these movies. No, there's no such thing as a circle of life. It's a linear. Before and after is not just a circle. We're all just going to kind of come back. At, no, it doesn't happen. Yeah, go ahead. The certainty. And, and he may have even had some sense of what that was, but it yeah. doesn't mean that he knew all the detail, fine details of all that right. either, because they're happening in time. I mean, that's kind of what you're saying. Yeah, yeah. The, the prophets are looking ahead, and they have some, like uh, Peter talks about, how they, they long to understand. And the words there is actually timing, they, but they don't understand how it's all going to happen. And, and like when you're looking at that picture, you don't, they didn't know. Actually, there's a big separation between these things. They didn't know that, oh, because they didn't, they didn't have a real clear understanding of, you yeah, have the first coming and the second coming. They're like, God's coming. The Messiah's coming. He's coming. And that's what the Jews got confused on. They thought all, you know, and now we can see. No, there's actually a separation between his, his, um, his, uh, his second coming, where he's coming in power and glory, Revelation 19, between his first coming, where he comes in great humility. They didn't understand that there's a separation between those two. And we, we obviously do, because we can look at hindsight. We have the scriptures that clearly tell us that. So, we don't know any steps, That's, and I, I didn't want to discourage you, um, but, you know, every, every believer thought, what? This is, it's, we're the generation, right? Now, we know it really is our generation, right? We really know. He's coming back in our lifetimes, right? Although, as you get older, you're like, eh, maybe not. <laughs> you know? uh, but, uh, I, yeah, they always hoped that. They hoped that. They didn't, they didn't, all throughout church history, they hoped that. Or even before that, Old Testament. They hoped that, you know, from Simeon in the, the temple. You know, they hoped that. You know, we hope that. We long for that. But we don't know. It could be... 10,000 years, you know, but God will be glorified during that time. God's going to do a work in that time. Um, all the things he's provided, means of grace will be sufficient. And we know we'll be with him, right? We're not going to be here then on earth, thankfully. We're going to be with him. And so we'll be, yeah, it'll, it'll, it'll be fine. Don't worry about it. <laughs> supposed to hope that. Absolutely. We're supposed to hope that. You're supposed to hope. Maranatha, even so come Lord Jesus, you know. No. Oh, no, no. It's a good hope. It's a very good hope. It, it encourages you that, yeah, it might be. And, it, and also, what does it do? It causes you to live soberly. That's one of the things that, if you know, there's a lot of, parab a lot of uh, uh, parables of Christ told about that. If you know that your master could come, oh, okay, you're going to live more carefully. So that's, it's a good thing to hope that. And, and that's, I, don't, I don't make fun of the church. I encourage, yeah, that's great. The church thought, yeah, it could be in our lifetime. It could be in our lifetime. Interesting, when I, I've been to Russia a number of times. They long, they long particularly during persecution, because 
because it was so hard. It was, they had no, in this life there was, it was, they had very hopeless lives, very difficult, very hard, hard, hard lives. And so they had a great hope. It's more challenge for us because we get attracted by other things that really have no comparison, but we get attracted by those things, but they didn't. And so that's a good, a good admonition to be encouraged um, in that. Okay, so um, prophetic perspective. As these prophecies are looking ahead, some of the prophecies include first coming prophecies, some of them include second coming prophecies, and some of them have them together, uh, very close. And that's what Peter is looking at in Acts chapter 2. That's all I'm saying. Second thing is dual fulfillment. Uh, some of these prophecies have dual fulfillment. What do I mean by that? I, I mean that there is a, an initial fulfillment of some type. Uh, Isaiah 7, 14. Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, a virgin will be a child and bear a son, and she will call his name Emmanuel. Now we, obviously, we, we have Matthew, who Matthew refers back to this. But there is a, this was actually a real-life historical situation with Ahaz. And there's, a, there's actually, almost certainly, there is a, the Hebrew word for virgin here um, is a, a young woman. Uh, um, Matthew gives it a Greek meaning, which rightly so, uh, of Mary, that she was a virgin, the virgin birth. But there was actually a young woman, almost certainly either Isaiah 8 or something in history, that had a child that was the immediate fulfillment of this. That became what's called a historical prophetic. In other words, an event happened in history that pointed ahead to a future event. Okay, so that's all I'm to say is that there's a, sometimes there is a dual fulfillment. It was fulfilled in history. This Isaiah 7, 14 was fulfilled in history, in that, in that, in the, in the 8th century, B, 7th century BC. It was fulfilled, but not fully. That, even that fulfillment pointing ahead to a true virgin birth, which Matthew says in Matthew 1, that, that, the Greek word can only mean virgin birth. Um, this one uh, is broader um, than that. So just give you a kind of a background. And that when you say, what's he talking about here? Um, let's give kind of an overview, uh, a summary of, of this. Here, uh, in, on your, what page is it on? Is it 45? 44, okay. Um, I just, there is, just kind of groups. Um, the, his lineage, you know, there's a, a number of... Uh, 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 prophecies about his lineage. Obviously, the most important one is the, the virgin birth. Genesis 3 um, talks about that. Talks about the seed of Mary, which is a very unique way of referring to the, the virgin birth um, very clearly. Um, and then the Isaiah 7, 14 um, as well, the virgin birth clearly. And then there's a whole bunch of um, he, you know, lineage of Shem, lineage of Abraham, lineage of Isaac, lineage of, of Jacob, Judah, David. I mean, all these from, you know, Genesis 49, 10, it says... Uh, that the Messiah would come from the tribe of Judah, which if you know the book of Genesis, that's like, what? Judah? The one that seemed to have kind of the, some major issues? Now, the reality is we just don't know about the other guys as much because the, the, the last part of Genesis focuses on Joseph and Judah, but it focuses on Joseph because he's going to save, he's going to save the, the, the people. It focuses on Judah because he's going to be the line of the Messiah. So, I mean, it's, it's his lineage um, very clearly. Now, what's, what's the, the major point about that, about lineage? Why is that so significant? Christ's lineage. Did you get to pick your lineage? No, you didn't get to pick your parents or, aunts or grandparents or great, 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 grandparents. Christ did. I mean, why? Because he's sovereign. It was determined. And so people say, well, no, he just kind of orchestrated all these things. You can't orchestrate your lineage. You just can't do that very clearly. His birth, obviously, the his his the virgin birth, Isaiah 7, 14, very clearly points ahead to that. Matthew 1 ties that together, the nature of his birth, the place of his birth, Micah 5. The Bethlehem. He's going to be born in Bethlehem. You didn't get to pick where you were born, right? Um, Christ did in his sovereignty. Um, his life, there's tons of prophecies about um, his life. Who's the forerunner? Isaiah 40 talks about, talks about uh, John the Baptist. Uh, his ministry, Isaiah 53, talks about him bearing the sicknesses of, of people. Christ is going to perform miracles. He's going to heal people. By his stripes we are healed. That actually is, is used in reference to his physical healing, also spiritual healing, but physical healing by the gospel. Um, writers, his teaching. It's it said that, that he would teach in parables. 
Christ taught with a lot of parables. That was prophesied. Um, it prophesied in Psalm 18 that he'd be rejected. Um, uh, prophecies concerning his death. Probably one of the best ones is Psalm 22. Uh, just the whole nature of his death. I mean, just the, the agony of the sufferings. Isaiah 52 and 53, that he's going to have a very violent, violent death uh, in fulfillment um, of those prophecies. Um, very clearly. And then uh, his victory. I mean, that would be uh, prophecies about his resurrection, that he would, uh, he would, he would be resurrected from the dead. Psalm um, 16, very clearly. Uh, and Peter quotes Psalm 16 in Acts 2, that um, God would not allow him to, to continue and de- decay in, the, um, in, the, uh, in his grave, that he would be resurrected. That was pro- Peter applies that directly to the resurrection, Psalm 16. So it's, it's prophesied um, in, in his um, victory. So there's hundreds, some, some would say like 300, over 300 prophecies about Christ, and, and he perfectly fulfills them, particularly in the book of Matthew. I mean, I'm reading, I just kind of rotate through the gospel but I'm reading through Matthew again. And uh, numerous times it says that it might be fulfilled, and then it quotes the Scripture. That it might be fulfilled, quotes the Scripture. Why? Who was Matthew written to? Jews. Matthew's written to a Jewish audience who have been very familiar with the, the Old Testament. And so Matthew is connecting the, all these Old Testament prophecies about the Messiah. He's connecting them to the person of Christ. So it's just very, 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 very clear that this Jesus who walked among us, he fulfilled uh, those prophecies. So there's just lots and lots and lots and lots uh, of, of prophecies. Any questions prophecy-wise? I know I didn't go through those in detail. But we could spend a lot of time on that. Names of Christ? Yeah, Ben. Um, so, I know that there are places in Scripture that, well, in the New Testament, there are points of the Old Testament Scripture that say this is a message of prophecy. How, like, one of them that I'm particularly confused with is when David's talking with Solomon. Right. That passage is messianic. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the question is, is, you know, Scripture, you have a lot of things that seem to be Messianic, and like David talking to Solomon, and how do you know whether it is Messianic or not? One way is very clear is if the Old Testament quotes it. I mean, I'm sorry, New Testament quotes it. If Matthew says, this was to fulfill what, well then, okay, I know that for sure. It, it's 100%. Now, as um, Americans in our society, when you quote someone, what do you do? Gus, you could tell it's because you're, you know, all the dissertations, but what do you have to do? Quotes, word for word, note the source, right? Otherwise, what? You get in trouble. You get in trouble. I mean, we've had accounts of people, oh, I wrote this thing, and you're like, you didn't write that. Somebody else wrote it. Uh, old, um, at this time in history, it was not as like, like you had to quote it word for word. You have to say exactly where the verse was. Some, many of the things that we see are allusions, but they clearly are allusions. So it's not, you say, well, he didn't quote it word for word, so it's not a prophecy. Well, no, but he's referring to that. Um, and so you, it's basically looking at the, the context of the New Testament. It's referring to something. And then where else is, is that talked about in the, in the Old Testament? It's not going to be quite as clear as sometimes we like it to be. Like, oh, here's the reference. Well, one, they didn't have references like we do in our Bible. Uh, and two, they just didn't always do that. Um, they would have been so familiar with their Bibles also if they just said it. They, oh, he's talking about this. He's talking about Isaiah 53. I know that. Or he's talking about Psalm 22. I know that. They were so much more familiar with their Bibles than we were that they were able to say, yeah, obviously that's an illusion. Look at the book of Hebrews. There is lots and lots and lots and lots of the book of Hebrews related to that. So it's really context. I'm um, looking at the context of that. Good question. Good question. But it's not quite as smooth as we would like it to have. Why don't you cite your source? You're in trouble. No, he's, he is. He's doing it appropriate within the time frame. Names of Christ. Um, uh, names of Christ. Um, biblical times, names had great significance. I mean, there are probably, some would say, between 200 and 300 names of Christ, titles of Christ, descriptions of Christ. It depends on what you call a name of Christ, but there's, it seems like there's, there's just a, a, a lot of them. Uh, but in the, in the scriptures, a name had a lot more significance than, um, than in our time. Um, Generally, when, well, for any of you that have been a parent, you named a child, well, you didn't know what that child was going to be like, and you may have given them a name that had special meaning um, because you were hoping, Lord willing, the child would grow into that, or you just liked it. That sounds great. Um, names go in phases. You know, there's some phases that names go through. You can clearly track it through history. Um, but in the scriptures, names are very different than that. Names, particularly to God, this is a revelation. Who named 
Who, 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 who names Christ in all these names? Who? He does, okay? He does, God does. He says, and so these are revelation. The names of Christ are revelation about some aspect of his character, about who he is. Now, you may, your name may mean something that may have nothing to do with who you are, okay? Um, Christ, his names mean a lot. They have a lot to do with who he is. Um, uh, um, here's a quote um, from uh, uh, a Jewish man, Everman's Talmud. Um, to the Oriental, by that it means the ancient Near Eastern um, uh, people in that area of the Mesopotamia. A name is not merely a label as with us. It was thought of as indicating the nature of a person or object by whom it was born. For that reason, special reverence attached to the distinctive name of the deity which he had revealed to the people of Israel, the Tetragrammaton, which is also called Yahweh. And so their names meant, a, and not real scholarly, but what they're saying is their names meant a lot. Their names meant a lot. It had significance. Remember when Peter, I mean, Christ changes Peter's a name. When uh, God changes Abraham's name, they're saying, never Sarah's name there's significance um, uh, to that and so their names are very significant I like what uh, Spurgeon said I do not attempt to defend my God nor stand here to apologize for him when I assert that the one great end of all that he does is to make for himself a name since it is by the making of that name that men are blessed in the very highest degree and help to holiness and happiness I would rather ask you to praise him that sitteth upon the throne that he thus manifests himself for our good can only be achieved by the glory of God's name so we talk about the names of God or names of Christ particularly in this one it's very significant because they're revelations um, of uh, him Revelations of him. And then I have a I have a list down there. I don't know how many I have there, but there's more. That's just some of them. Uh, and, do I have a list down there? Yeah, there's there's more and just some of the references to that. Some of them are titles like you like from Adam. He's called he's called the Adam in First Corinthians 15. It's a symbolic name. He, the first uh, uh, Romans 5 parallels that. Um, in that Christ is called the second Adam, right? He's the second Adam because he's the fulfillment um, uh, all the way to the Word, John 1:1. 1, 1, um, to um, he's called the door of the sheepfold. He's called Emmanuel, friend of sinners. He's called King, King of Israel, King of Kings. All kinds of names. Um, and you could, you could have a great study. Some of us look at the names of, of God, names of Christ, particularly. be a great study. What do I learn about Christ from this particular name of him? Because it's a revelation of God um, about him. Okay. Well, that's all I'm going on that. We can spend a lot more time on it. Any questions? Name? Okay. Okay. Now we get to the incarnation. Okay? The incarnation. I've done all that. I've done all that to, to help you understand it. Christ existed before, right? That's all, that's all pretty much the focus of that was. Uh, uh, Christ uh, existed um, before. Um, the incarnation. We're going to look at uh, incarnation. What is the incarnation? I'm going to give you a definition right off the bat, and then we're going to talk about what it means. Okay? I think this is in your notes. Is this in your notes? Yeah. Maybe not. I don't know. Uh, the condescension and humiliation of Christ where he voluntarily waived the rights and privileges of deity he took on the limitation of humanity he veiled but did not give up any of his attributes okay this is the incarnation where he took on human form he became a man um, <clears throat> Philippians 2 specifically calls it his uh, humiliation key phrase there voluntarily this is not forced him I don't want to do this I don't want to do this no um, Christ willingly uh, became a man um, so that he could accomplish the work that God had called him to do his father had called him to do he voluntarily became a man he waived the rights and privileges of deity. And I'm, I'm really, we're really careful in what we say, okay? He did not become any less God. He just waived the privileges. Um, he waived the, the rights. I mean, imagine, you know, when he's, you know, walking, you know, walking on, on earth, uh, when you see it probably most classically when he is, you know, bound, the God of the universe is bound. He's there before Pilate. Um, he allows himself to be beaten. He, you know, they, they think they have authority over him, but no, it's all voluntary. At, any, at an instant, at an instant, um, he could have called Legion of Angels, but he didn't even need angels. He could just just stopped all this um, but he didn't yeah, he, he, he waived the rights and privileges he took on the limitations of 
um, humanity. Um, so that he, he, the key is, is he did not become any less God. That's the key. He did not become any less God. Well, he kind of gave up, he gave up part of his deity so that he could add on humanity. That's unbiblical. Christ did not give up any of his deity. He gave up the expression of his deity. He gave up the rights of his deity. He gave up the, um, the, the, the way that people should have um, treated him, the, the privileges of his deity that he deserved to be treated a certain way. He, he didn't demand um, that. He took on the limitations of humanity, which is is amazing. How does God take on limitations? Well, he becomes a man. He becomes a man. Um, that's how he did it. And then um, that last phrase is key. We'll look at it a little later. He veiled but did not give up any of his attributes. He didn't give up any of that. He veiled them. Now, there's some nuances. How did that work? You know, like think of the omnis, the omniscience. You know, well, didn't he know? And, you know, there's some veiling. Um, it says he learned, you know, and he was asking questions there. Uh, the pastor that David preached on, he was asking questions of the religious leaders. He was learning. And so he's, he's, he's veiling. He's veiling uh, the full expression. Um, but the key is, is he didn't give up any of his attributes. He didn't give up any of those. He was still completely sovereign. He was still, yeah, he didn't give up, give them up. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, we're going to go there. We're going to look specifically. That's called the kenosis. No, that's a great question. Uh, is the uh, is Philippians two when he said he emptied himself? Um, is that yes? That's 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 part of the veiling. Empty. The key is he did not empty himself of any of his deity. That's the key. He did not give up any of his deity. That that's not. He did not. He emptied himself. In other words, it's the full expression of that. Now, obviously, there's a mystery. We we can't fully understand that. How does 100 percent God, 100 percent man? How does that work? We can't, we can't understand that. Um, but it's very clear he did not give up any of the attributes. Because if he's not fully God, we're going to look at why that's so critical. He, yeah, if he's not fully God, then he cannot die for all the sins of the, everyone who ever believed in him for all time. It, it's not possible. <clears throat> so yeah, he did not, he, it, was, it was veiled. I know there's some nuances, but it's, I think it's important to, to ask some of those critical um, words. Okay? Incarnation, the, the purpose. Okay? Okay, question. I want you to talk to him about this right, right amongst you. Okay? Why did Christ become a man? Why was it so necessary? Why, why did Christ become a man? This is part of the incarnation. We're going to talk about why he became a man. We're talking about why he had to be God. But the first part is, why, why did Christ, why did the Messiah have to be a man? Okay, go and turn to the people right next to you and talk about why was it so essential? Why did he have to become a man? Okay, why, why, why did Christ, why did the Messiah, why did Christ, why did he have to be a man? Why do we have, why, why do we need the incarnation in God's yeah, economy, why? What are some reasons you can think of? Yes, Todd. In order to die. Okay, in order to die. Whoa, absolutely critical, right? And, and when God can't die. And that, so when it says that the penalty of sin is 
death. And uh, the, when God gave the, the, to Adam and Eve, if you eat of this, you're going to die. Um, he has to become a man so he can die, right? All of us, part of our humanity is what? Our finiteness, right? We're going to die, okay? We're gonna, and so um, he had to become a man so he could die. Great, critical issue. Okay, good. What else? Okay. Okay, yeah. You're talking about gender issues. That's not that that's critical to our society today. <laughs> we wouldn't even raise that 10 years ago, right? Um, yeah, text is clear. You had to become, a, uh, in the Old Testament, a male lamb. You know, the perfect lamb was a part of that. Okay? So I'm making a statement about one gender better than another. It's just what God said. This is the way it had to be. Okay, good. Yeah, Becky. Okay. Yeah, he was two and he was four. He had to be a great high priest. So, he, and particularly, it says he had to be to be a, a sympathetic and faithful high priest. So that, I mean, so that you know, no, he was tempted in all of his years. It's not unique. Yeah. Okay. Good. Great observation. What else? Yeah, Brent. Yes. Yes. Yeah, to make God known to us. God is a revealing God. And to, to he, Christ, be, he became a man to reveal God to us, right? He, he walked among us, right? And we read about that in the Gospels, to reveal God. Excellent. Great observation. What else? Birch? I was, and I could be wrong with this, but does Galatians 3 where it says Christ became a curse for us because of the law, is that also Okay, in Galatians 3 where it says Christ became a curse for us, well... Um, he had to become a man in order for him to bear the... Well, and what's the brunt of the curse? What's the essence of the curse? Death. Okay? The curse is what? What was the curse? The curse said the soul that sins will die. It's related to what Todd said. So to take on that curse, um, he had to become a man. Okay? We need the incarnation. Good. Other things. Well, I just, I, you got most of them. I'll just, I have them in your notes there, but um, uh, here's just some reasons why Christ had to become a man. And this one's just obvious because God said that. He had to become a man. Genesis 3.15, um, I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your seed and her seed. Uh, he shall bruise you on the head and you shall bruise him on the heel. The only way Christ could uh, do that is to become a man, to fulfill the promise of God. Uh, secondly, to fully reveal God. This is what Brent referred to. He referred to Colossians 1. Or all of Colossians is great on that. But I would go back to John 1.18. No man has seen God at any time. But this God wants to be seen. God wants to be seen. The only begotten God is in the bosom of the Father. He has uh, explained him or displayed um, him. Uh, Christ reveals God. Just think about their attributes of God that by Christ living on this earth and taking on human flesh, we can grasp, right? Uh, the, the scriptures that you have in your hand, uh, written in uh, Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek, this is a limitation, right? God limited himself in order so that humans, who speak human language or read human language could understand God, right? It, but it's a limitation. This isn't everything about God. This isn't the full picture of God. But this is enough so that humans, with our limitations, we can understand. This is a limitation. Um, so also with, with uh, Christ. He took on the limitation of humanity so that we could understand. I mean, when you're, if you're a parent or whoever, if you're talking to a two-year-old, you got to get on their level, okay? You're going to talk a little differently. I trust. Uh, otherwise, I have no idea what you're talking about. Um, you don't, you need to talk very concrete, right? Don't talk, you know, all these theories. No, they won't get it. They won't understand it. Christ had one, the goal was so that he could fully reveal God. Three, uh, to take away sin. And this is, this is a critical one. Um, critical one. Um, if he was going to die, um, John 1, 29, the next day he saw Jesus coming to him and said, Behold the Lamb God who takes away uh, the sin uh, of the world. I mean, he has to do that. He cannot die unless he becomes um, a, a human. Um, 
Yeah. And then Becky referred to this one, uh, to become a merciful and faithful high, high priest. Therefore, he had to be made. I love that phrase. It's not just optional. He had to be made, like his brethren in all things, that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God, to make propitiation for the sins of the people. For since he himself was tempted in that which he suffered, he's able to come to the aid of those who are, are tempted. Um, Hebrews 4 says, For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, uh, but one who has been tempted in all things as we are yet without sin. Uh, therefore, let us draw near with confidence to the throne of grace, then we will find grace and mercy and help in time of need. A part of his becoming a man is what? That you know he sympathizes with you, right? If you're just trying to connect with the God on Sinai or whatever, Old Testament, it's hard. But you know, he, he walked this earth. It says he was tempted in all ways and yet without sin. He understands uh, what you're going through. Um, very much so. Um, so this is that's a key one, why he had to become a man. Uh, another one. To demonstrate perfect humanity. Scripture says this. First John 2, 6. The one who says he abides in him ought himself to walk in the same manner as he walked. Oh, this takes away the excuses. Right? It's like, <laughs> yeah, right. You just, you've just been in heaven the whole time. And, and No. He walked on earth. He, and he was the perfect example. He always said the right thing. He always did the right thing. He always thought the right thing. And so that we have a perfect example. Now, you can never achieve that example, but it's helpful for you to have a perfect example. First John 2 says, so that you can seek to emulate, right? You can seek to follow. Um, here's how he responded. Uh, yeah, to in lots of different um, situations. I mean, kids, young people. This is a great passage um, that um, and David preached on it you know, about, you know, in Christ, he's, he's, he's there and he's uh, in the temple and, and his mom and dad, they don't get it. And yet the next phrase says what? He kept himself under subjection to them. And yet they don't understand. They, they, don't, they don't get what in the world. What a great example for us, even children, young people. My parents don't understand. Well, Christ's parents didn't understand at all. Um, and yet he still was under submission. I mean, you go all the way to the... What about when he was uh, treated unjustly? Ever been treated unjustly? Wow. I mean, Christ is a great example to being treated un, unjustly. Um, all kinds of things. He provides us a, a perfect example for us to follow. Uh, another one, to become the head of the body of the church. Uh, one of the reasons uh, he, um, he raised him, uh, he, which he brought about in Christ when he raised him from the dead, seated him in his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion, every name that's named not only in this age, the age to come. He put all things in subjection under his feet, gave him his head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. A part of his humanity is that he was that perfect. He became the head of the body, uh, the church. And then lastly, to judge and restore uh, the universe to God. Um, he must reign until he has put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy that will be abolished is death, for he has put all things in subjection to his feet. When he says all things are subjection, it's evident that he is accepted to put all things subject to him. When all things are subjected to him, then the Son himself will be subjected to the one who subjected all things to him, that God may be all in all. Okay, so Christ became a man. Part of that is to rule um, over all things. We see that in Revelation 19 when he, he comes back um, very clearly. For the purpose. So let's talk another question. Okay, I'm going to talk to people right around you. On this question, what did it involve when Christ became a man? Did he, now, I've already given you some answers on this, but this is our people to talk about. Did he stop being God at all? Was he merely a man in appearance? Why or why not? Okay, so let's talk about that. What does it mean that Christ became a man? We're kind of, now we're going to dive into the, the essence of the incarnation. Okay, turn to people around you. Talk about what does it mean when Christ became a man? What, maybe it's helpful to talk about what it doesn't mean. Sometimes it's helpful to define somebody. Well, it can't mean this, it can't mean this, it can't mean this. Okay, what does it mean and what didn't it mean? Okay, go.
Christ became a man. Um, did he stop being God at all? Was he merely a man in appearance? Why or why not? What are some things before we kind of dive into the kenosis and the apostolic union? What does that mean? What does it mean when Christ became a man? Yeah, Becky. Okay, fully God, 100% God, 100% man. He didn't kind of give up half of his deity and, and kind of half of his humanity, and he kind of came together as a 50% God and 50% man. Okay, no, 100% God, 100% man. Okay, good. Which we can't fully grasp because we don't know anything like that. Okay, what else? Yeah, did Christ learn to walk? Did Christ have to learn to talk? Well, yes. Um, now there's a big question. Did Christ ever get sick? Well, I think by what happens on the cross and the pain and agony he has on the cross, I think that could point us back to, there's no recorded instances of that, but he lived in a sin-cursed human side, um, body, right? So to say, well, he never got sick. Yeah, I think he'd wrestle with that a little bit. He says, attempted in all ways as we are. Well, one of the things that you wrestle with is the limitations of your human body, right? Okay, good. What else? Did he stop? Did he stop being God at all in any way? No, no way. He didn't give up any of his attributes. He did not give, he didn't give up any of his deity at all, okay? Um, And this is related to Daniel's question about the um, human appearances of Christ in the Old Testament, right? Remember we saw several of those in in, uh, Genesis uh, 18 and and, uh, Joshua 5. We see Christ appears as a man, but as we talked about when Daniel asked that question is, but he he just, it was, he took on the form of, he looked like a man, but he didn't become a man until Kill, uh, the incarnation. So he didn't just have a man in appearance like an, an angel. Angels took the form of men occasionally. Christ didn't just took the external. He actually became a man. He, how do we call it? We'll talk about this later. A human nature. Okay? He, okay? Kenosis. Let's give me a definition there. Okay? Uh, what is the, the kenosis? Christ voluntarily giving up the full expression of his divine rights and attributes. He gave up the full expression of his <clears throat> divine rights and attributes. Um, he didn't hold on to those. He didn't cling to those. He didn't demand those. Well, I'm God. You have to treat me differently. He gave up the full expression of his divine rights um, and attributes. Um, two aspects of this. Okay, two aspects of the, the kenosis. Kenosis, I'm sorry, kenosis is from the uh, Philippians 2, where it says he emptied himself. The Greek um, word for emptying is kanao, and that's where you get this term kenosis. It's basically a transliteration of that word. It means to em- he emptied himself. What does that mean? For two things that the kenosis involves. One, is our incarnation or leaving heaven's glory to take a human nature. He left heaven's glory to take on. He, he, he left the, of being by his father's side. Um, even though he, now you say, well, so then you see it throughout his life on this earth, he would draw away, right? He would draw away to pray. We well, didn't have to draw away to pray when he's in heaven with his father because he's just with his father. Um, Part of the emptying was uh, that he had that limitation of not being in heaven's glory with his heavenly father. And then his humiliation or a life of suffering leading to and including the cross. So it includes his incarnation, leaving heaven's glory, but also a life of suffering. And his life of suffering didn't start with the, the beating or the arrest. His life of suffering started at the point of his birth in that Bethlehem stable. Um, he was, he was, he, that was a humbling, it was an, an emptying. Uh, the God of the universe he gave himself up to the limitations of uh, humanity. Uh, it's amazing. Philippians 2, this is the key passage. Have this attitude in yourself, which was also in Christ Jesus, who although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself. That's the word kanao. That's where you get this doctrine from. Taking the form of a bondservant, being made in the likeness of men, being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. Therefore God highly exalted him, stood on him the name, which is above every name. This is the, the emptying. The emptying. We can't grasp this, right? Because we don't. We, we're humans. This is all we know. Um, but the God of the universe emptied himself with a full expression. Um, so the question is, what happened to Christ's divine attributes? Key question. What happened to his, his attributes? Um, 
A couple things. One, it was a voluntary restriction of the use of his attributes. Okay, it's voluntary restriction. Now we see that being pulled back at times. We see miracles. He performs amazing miracles. So, but the voluntary restriction of the use of his attributes, um, clearly. And secondly, his divine attributes were veiled by his flesh, his humanity. That's kind of the veil that, that veils it. Um, he, he fully conformed to all aspects of human life, yet without sin. He was a real human. He really was. He wasn't just kind of God that put on a human costume. He was a human. And we'll talk about this when we talk about the hypostatic union, that he had a human nature, and a, a, a divine nature, and a human nature that were distinct um, throughout that. Okay? Uh, let me introduce that just real quick, okay? And then we'll, we'll stop there because this is where you really get into the... You know, we're in the deep end of the pool here. But I think you need to be in the deep end of the pool because it helps you to appreciate the significance of what Christ did. Uh, and there's a term called the hypostatic union. And maybe you've never even heard that word before. You probably didn't use it this past week um, unless you read ahead um, in your notes. What's the hypostatic union? Definition, the unique combination of full deity and true humanity in one, in the person of Christ. Okay? Christ's uh, human nature, Christ's divine nature still remain distinct in the one person of Christ. This is really critical. It's not an amalgamation um, of those. He had a, a divine nature united in one person. And these two natures of Christ were inseparably joined together. Did I have that? Um... He had a human nature and a divine nature united in one person. There's not two persons of Christ. There's not a human person of Christ and a divine person of Christ. No, there's one person of Christ. But he has a, a human nature and a divine nature in the one person of Christ. The two natures were inseparably joined together without conversion, composition, or confusion. I'm using kind of some theological terms because that's what they would use to help you understand that he didn't have just one nature. He had a divine nature and a human nature connected in the one person um, of Christ. Oopsie, back up there. Okay, well, I'm going to draw it there, and then I'm going I'm to explain that more next week. And you think, whoa, I've never even thought about that. Um, but it is important. We'll talk about next week why it's important. Any quick questions related to that? Got a little dazed look. It's like, wow, John, it's kind of early on Sunday morning for me to be thinking about these things. But I'm trying to, to press you to think about some things that are, are very important. Very important. Yeah. Yes, Stacey. That would be a bummer being a sibling, wouldn't it? <laughs> <laughs> um, but as a, a two-year-old, his brain, his two-year-old's brain, was so yeah. open to things that were not God. And we kind of get into the, the, the divine nature, human nature, this discussion right here related to that. He, there's a nuance there that scriptures don't fully help us to understand, right? There's a, just a nuance there that, that we don't get inside the mind of Christ and, and know what was he actually thinking. Sometimes we do a little bit, um, but there's just a, a mystery there. There's a mystery um, there. He limited himself. He, limited, he learned. He learned how to walk. He learned how to talk in his human um, side. Um, he was perfect. He never sinned. We usually learn by how? Sinning and making mistakes. He never learned that way. He never learned that way. Um, he learned. He was learning, it says, from the, from the uh, religious leaders there. Um, even though they were very imperfect, obviously, he learned from them. So, yeah, we, it's just a mystery. I, I don't want to hide behind that, but it just doesn't go into great detail on the text as far as what did he know when and what was he thinking when. Does it say it? And that's where we can gaze into that and be thankful for it. Yeah, Gus. Yes. Right. 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 
Yes, uh, Gus's statement is so key. Is the errors are when we try to, to pull all these things. We try to explain it in a way that we can understand, right? And here's the reality. Let's say, oh, at some point, God will just explain it to me. No, even if God explained it, you wouldn't understand it. His, his sovereign plan, that's pride to say. Well, if he just told me what he's doing, I, I'd get, you won't get it. You don't understand it. And I think that's a good uh, point, Gus, that that's where error comes in is when we try to force it into a, a human understanding when God says, my ways are not your ways, neither are my thoughts your thoughts. For sorry, the heavens are above the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. Good. Let's close on that, and we'll come back at this point, um, and we'll talk about this, the whole hypostatic union of Christ. Christ, we are in awe, we are in wonder at what you've done um, in becoming a man. I pray that we would just worship you and praise you and give you glory, and it would, it would cause us to live in a way that pleases you because we are so overwhelmed. Thank you, Lord, in your name. Amen.